Thank you. And so today we're going to talk about infant mortality. Specifically, what is it? The high rate of infant mortality in Detroit, the causes, the city of Detroit's fetal infant mortality review case review team, which is a mouthful, we call it femur, and identifying the gaps in services that can prevent future infant deaths. So I'm going to start the first half, and then Sandra's going to pick up. What do we mean by infant mortality? Well, there's neonatal mortality, which occurs after a live birth and through the 27th day of life. It is very difficult to prevent neonatal deaths. It's easier to prevent post-neonatal mortality, which occurs starting the 28th day of life through the 11th month. Infant mortality is defined as a death between birth and the 364th day. Now some impor important facts. Our infant mortality rate is higher than every other industrial country in the US. Um, for example, Japan has an infant mortality rate of 2.1 per thousand live births. Canada, our neighbors to the south, have an infant mortality rate of 4.7. Neonatal de deaths are more common than postneonatal deaths, and neonatal deaths relate to genetic and to genetics and to conditions of delivery, while well, postneonatal refer to environmental causes. Since the late 1990s, the decline in infant mortality has been pretty slow. And all of you um, have a copy of this article, thanks to Sandra, that's entitled, Welcome to Detroit, where black babies are at higher risk of death. And it says, black infants die from premature birth at a rate that's more than twice the rest of the United States. 83% of Detroit residents are African American, and the preterm birth rate among black women in Michigan is 55% higher than the rate among all other women in the state. So we know that the infant mortality rate in the U.S. is 5.7 per thousand live births. In Michigan, it's 6.8. In Detroit, actually, there's a correction. It's now listed for 2017 as 14.2. But you can see the vast difference between our rate in Detroit, which is twice as high, more than twice as high as the state rate, and about two and a half times higher than the rate in the United States. Michigan currently ranks 37th out of 50 states, even though our rates have been falling. <coughs> and that's an important concern. So when we look at deaths among infants, the causes for neonatal deaths, as I mentioned, include congenital malformations, deformities, chromosomal abnormalities. It's caused also by low birth weight, which is under 5.5 pounds or 2,500 grams, as well as short gestational period, less delivering at less than 37 weeks gestational age. It can also be caused by maternal complications of pregnancy, which look at things such as hypertension, um, diabetes, hypertension is high blood pressure. Um, and circumstances surrounding delivery. The cord is wrapped around the infant's neck so the infant does not get sufficient oxygen and asphyxiation can cause decline in the functioning of organs, especially the brain. So we've made some progress in trying to address prematurity, but it's still very hard. Some women have shortened cervixes or cervixes that are called incompetent. So we have drug treatment and um, sutures to solve those problems. Um, we can treat infections that may trigger early deliveries, assuming that women are tested for it. 
and they can get drug treatment for it. Uh, we recommend abstaining from alcohol and drugs while pregnant to prevent premature birth. First, good nutrition is important. Um, neonatal deaths often happen when there's more than one fetus, when there's stress, when there's trauma, as well as short intervals between pregnancies. Recommendation is 18 months between pregnancies, but if you don't do that, your body is still recovering from the previous pregnancy and can cause issues. The past neonatal deaths are harder to define in terms of, of documenting what goes on, but they are more preventable. So uh, they're a function of environmental factors. They may be sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, kind of moving away from that term and now referring to sudden unexplained infant deaths where a medical examiner is not certain whether it was a SIDS death or the baby suffocated because um, they were caught in bedding or someone they were co-sleeping with rolled over on top of them. Um, lack of immunizations are important. Lack of adequate health care, nutritional deficiencies, and abuse, including shaken baby syndrome. One of the, re well, the third reason on the list is something that we find, unfortunately, common, and it is preventable. The issue is the baby is not sleeping safely. So babies are supposed to be sleeping on their back. So those who are not on their back and are put face down have a higher risk of death. And babies who co-sleep in bed with others, like adults or siblings, are also at higher risk of death because the co-sleeper may inadvertently roll over them and suffocate them. So, the Fetal Infant Mortality Review does a number of public health functions. It starts out with assessment, including monitoring the health and diagnosing and investigating things. Then policy development, inform, educating, empower people, mobilizing the community, develop policies, assurance, enforcing the laws, linking to and providing care, assuring a competent workforce, and evaluating it. So these are all things that we do. In assessment, we surveil and we look at the social context, the causes of the death. We, under assurance, we look at systems, content, and causes, contexts and causes. In a policy development, we try to inform, partner, and develop. So we use a lot of local, state, and federal resources. The way the femur system is set up is it starts with a local case team, which is what we're doing in the city of Detroit, and I serve on the femur committee. Um, the teams bring records to review, we review it, we make recommendations, and those go to local action for policy, practice, and prevention, as well as the state advisory board. State advisory board also makes policy changes practices and does prevention, and there is then hopefully national action for policy, practice, and prevention. So what we're going to be focusing on today um, in my part of the talk is what the local team is doing in Detroit. And I've served on that team for about 10 years? Yes. At least. Um, so the members of the team represent a variety of people. Um, physicians who are experts in maternal fetal medicine, nurses, social workers. I'm the only sociologist, but Sandra runs it. She's a sociologist, too. Um, mental health specialists, police detectives, public health workers, and community advocates. And when we meet, we review two or three cases. And those cases are selected based on death certificates that we receive from the state. We look at categories and causes of disease, so we may want to focus on certain kinds of deaths. We look at deaths that, are, um, that involve accidents or anomalies. And our case data sources are really um, 
quite diverse. We look at, at medical and clinical records. We look at maternal interviews that are done after the death by a social worker. We look at police reports, the medical examiner reports, and information from things like Child Protective Services, Women, Infant, and Children Supplemental Food Programs, Medicaid, as well as other government assistance. So we can try and figure out where things went wrong. So I'm going to give you an example of what we do in FEMER. And the ab we, get, we all get an abstract from the person who's abstracting all these records and pull it, putting them together. So when was the baby born? When did the baby die? What was the cause of death, if we know? Uh, how long the baby lived? What was the birth weight? The APGAR scores, and there's a handout with what APGAR is. It's appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration. And the higher the APGAR score, the healthier the baby is at birth, and they measure that both at the first minute and at five minutes. We look at maternal characteristics, age, race, education, employment, weight, body mass index, when she entered prenatal care, any missed appointments, living arrangements, she has a history of tobacco or alcohol use, mental illness, um, drug use, we have drug screen data on there too. Um, we ask, the woman is asked about intimate part, intimate partner violence, and previous births and outcomes. For the father, um, we try and get information on age, race, education, employment, and substance use. So the abstract and case summary contains both clinical and community-based information and maternal interview information. So we use these various sources and kind of have them in a mirror, and sometimes they don't agree so the medical records may say the woman had four previous pregnancies and the woman tells the social worker, no, I had six. Um, we look at what happens in prenatal care, labor and delivery, hospital course, social support, what was happening in, in the home after birth and the circumstances surrounding the death. Now the circumstances surrounding the death um, those data sometimes come from the medical examiner, the police that go to the home and investigate what's going on. We also have autopsy reports and death scene reenactments. So what happens with the death scene reenactment is they bring a toy doll that looks like a baby and ask the parents, now show me where the baby was sleeping when you discovered that they weren't breathing anymore. And that one of the um, nurses who worked closely with the police department actually was very clever because she used a white baby for black parents so they wouldn't identify so much and they could be more um, kind of unemotional about talking about the circumstances and uses a black baby for cases where it is a white death. And that's something that worked out very well in terms of parents explaining what's going on. Uh, also at the death scene, they look to see if there was a uh, crib. They look to see if there was blood on sheets, um, what the bedding looked like. Those can give clues as to whether it was a case of suffocation or something else. So we don't know the names of the babies or the moms or dads who are involved with this. And we get a summary from the nurse case abstractor as well as the maternal interviewer. And then we discuss the circumstances and pose questions for clarification. And we usually have a very lively discussion. And afterwards, we look at a summary of issues form of factors related to the mom and the baby. And we compile and craft relevant um, recommendations for forwarding to the community action team for policy consideration and implementation. So these are the categories of things that we look at, and I'll give you some examples of what these mean as we uh, go along. So 
preconception, interconception means did the woman get any care before she got pregnant or between pregnancies? If there was a problem with the last pregnancy because she had a high blood pressure, was that treated? Um, we look at the mother's medical status. Um, did she have a sexually transmitted infection? Did she have a bacterial infection of um, the fetal membranes? Was she obese? Did she have pre-existing diabetes or diabetes that um, emerged during pregnancy called gestational diabetes? Did she have high blood pressure? Um, was she young or an older mom? Because those are risk factors. Did she have more than four live births? Family planning, we look to see whether the pregnancy was intended or unintended and whether the baby was wanted or not. Substance use, did the mother admit to using alcohol, tobacco, and drugs because all those affect pregnancy? We look at what happened during prenatal care. Did the mom go to prenatal care? So many of our mothers don't have many prenatal visits or they depend on the emergency room to get their care. They don't have continuity, they don't see the same provider, they don't go to the same provider every time. There's no records that can be shared because so many systems in Detroit have their own set of electronic medical records and they don't talk to each other, which is very frustrating. Um, we look in terms of, you know, what happened to the fetus in pregnancy, what were the characteristics when the infant was born, like the APGAR score, did the infant get any pediatric care, um, what was going on in the environment, were they practicing safe sleep, what was the housing situation, was there clean water or not. Um, the injuries we look at, was the baby suffocated? Did, did it receive trauma of any sort? Did the woman have any social support? Um, the, what's the story with the partners, the father, the baby, and the caregiver? Were they present? Were they helping her? Was this woman all by herself trying to deal with a newborn? Were there family transitions like moves, divorces, um, separation? What was the level of mental health and stress? Depression is very common um, postpartum. And was the woman suffering from that? Did anybody pick it up? Um, there could be language barriers under culture. Did the woman have health insurance? Did, was she satisfied with the care that she received? Um, was there poor communication? Did she have access to childcare? Um, did she get transportation to and from? Were any services provided um, to help her? And both, you know, as the baby was dying, if it was a, not a quick death, or after the baby died, what was going on? And often we find problems with missing data. We just really don't know exactly what's going on. And so we, count, we, we categorize on this form whether something is present or not, whether it's contributing to the death. And that's something that's very hard sometimes for the team to establish, um, as well as whether something was unknown. We just don't know, you know, there are no records of such and such, so we don't know exactly what's going on. So these are, are obviously challenges for us. And then our recommendations fall into these categories. So we could say that, you know, the personal circumstances were such that the woman was frequently moving during pregnancy. And if we had had somebody who was following her, we could have provided a stable housing situation. Um, when she relocated from out of town, so she came to Detroit without knowing anybody in Detroit. Was she homeless? Did she have no social support? The medical issues of, that I've listed before are really critical, as well as non-compliance with the medical regimen. There also may be genetic defects. So she may have lost a previous child because of 
a chromosomal abnormality, but she was never tested for that abnormality, didn't know if it was on her side or the husband's side or both, nor was the fetus tested during pregnancy to see if that was a risk. Um, we are just constantly frustrated by a woman having multiple providers. So they'll go to one emergency room and get a prescription for a sexually transmitted infection. And then they go to another emergency room and the symptoms come back. And the symptoms come back because nobody tested the dad. Mm -hmm. there, there are health departments like in Baltimore, Maryland, where they automatically give a pregnant woman who has a sexually transmitted infection a prescription for her partner. The partner doesn't even need to come in, but they're trying to stop the cyclical spread of the sexually transmitted infection. Um, and so since emergency departments don't talk to one another and clinics don't talk to one another, this is a huge issue. As a result, and it's not surprising, um, many women who've lost a child don't trust their healthcare professionals. And some didn't even show up to a health professional until they were in active labor to deliver. You know, there are other issues like social chaos, overcrowded residents, and history of mental illness. So um, the last thing I'm going to, yeah. Could you go over the primary recommendations that you find a couple of weeks? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. going to the, okay. I was going to say, I'm going to talk about the primary recommendations. Okay that we have come up with before um, I turn it over to Sandra, who's going to give you a wider perspective on what FEMA is doing and, and how it communicates with the state and what the state priorities are. But she's going to have to hold up our onesies to okay. show. Yeah. So, yeah. so what we've done um, in terms of recommendations is moms who are HIV AIDS positive, OK? are supposed to have their infants on an antiretroviral drug for six weeks immediately after birth. It's an oral medication. And that will prevent the infant from developing HIV-AIDS. But we discovered through our review, and we were working with the HIV-AIDS task force from the state, that women were given a prescription for this drug when they went out of the door of the hospital. Catch is, babies in Michigan are not eligible for Medicaid until they are 30 days old. So they could not fill the prescription. And we said, what? So we said, this is not good. So now women get the free drugs immediately, and we make sure they have it before they go home from the hospital. We've also tried to promote the ABCs of safe sleep. So babies should sleep alone on their backs in a crib and in a smoke-free environment. And we have these wonderful onesies where if you can read the onesies, it'll tell you if the baby is sleeping in the right direction or not. So if you can read this, Please turn me over, is what one of them reads. <laughs> That's good. Um, we also have baby boxes, which are sturdy cardboard boxes with a very tight fitting mattress and um, a mattress cover that is very cheap. And we also have pack and play cribs, which are, are very safe for babies. And we try and give those to moms to make sure that the baby is not put to sleep on a couch with pillows because that's a disaster. Um, we try to encourage continuity of prenatal, postnatal, and pediatric care. We offer grief bereavement support. There are six sessions, and it promotes education, self-efficacy, birth spacing, goal setting, and grief support. So many of these women got no grief support in the hospital. Nobody talked to them. We're sorry your baby died. Goodbye. Seriously. And we said, no, no, no. Because sometimes, you know, the woman is the woman is so upset that the first thing she thinks about doing is to have another baby, which at that point is not safe. I mean, we need to find out what caused the death. We need to see if we can make a healthy pregnancy the next time. 
you know, get hypertension or diabetes under control, get the sexually transmitted infections under control. And so we've got a wonderful social worker who does this, but she's only one person, and we need more. And finally, we train health providers on our findings, and also first responders, because first responders need to understand um, infant mortality. They need to be able, if they're called when a baby um, has died, they need to be able to assess the situation. I mean, sometimes parents want to, you know, clean all the sheets and take everything away, and that gives us evidence. You know, I mean, we don't charge parents whose babies die from unsafe sleep, but, you know, we need to know what's going on so we can educate them the next time you have a baby, you need to do this, it's just really critical. And um, so that's what we've been doing in FEMUR, and Sandra's going to take it over and talk about what the state is doing and lo other local FEMURs. Well, one of the things I did want to uh, expound on is the baby box. We're trying to uh, provide safe sleep environments for babies, and the baby box has, um, it's the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology approves of pack and play sleep environments and cribs. The baby boxes are convenient, but they are not uh, ACOG approved as yet, or that I know of, so there's the, the, the jury is still out on the baby boxes. Um, and for the grief and bereavement sessions that we offer, when our maternal interview goes out to do an interview with the mom, we're asking her to identify mothers or families that appear to have complicated grief. Not that you're not gonna have grief anyway, but we want um, to identify moms with complicated grief. And the Mayo Clinic says that Losing a loved one is one of the most distressing and unfortunately common experiences people face. Most people experience normal grief and bereavement have a period of sorrow, numbness, and even guilt and anger. Gradually these feelings erase and, possi and it's possible to accept the loss and move forward. However, for some people, the feelings of loss are debilitating and don't improve even after time passes. So this is known as complicated grief. So when our maternal interviewer goes out to the house, she's able to assess how mom is doing, what the house looks like. Sometimes the moms might create what she calls like a, sh a shrine, or people can't go to a certain portion of the room or whatnot, that's complicated grief. So she's given these additional six sessions uh, to help her to uh, focus in on herself, her health, what she's eating, goal setting, and uh, the importance of space and birth. So the grief and bereavement sessions, uh, we started last year and they uh, invariably were well received. So just wanted to share that. Now the state of Michigan has, um, and I wanted to show you this as well, the state of Michigan issue this 2016 to 2019 infant mortality reduction plan. And it outlines nine overarching goals to reduce infant mortality. And one is unintended, unwanted pregnancies, inadequate birth spacing, as Dr. Hanke had mentioned, um, 18 months apart. Uh, birth spacing is very, very important, and it's important for good health because like she had mentioned, oftentimes women will have repeat pregnancies or replacement pregnancies. Um, so unfortunately, the issues that occurred had not, won't be addressed. So we're do, encouraging unwanted uh, and unintended pregnancies to be addressed as an overarching theme at the state level. And the state level has also said that uh, as a theme that's late, inadequate prenatal care, especially for women of color, that's a thing that's identified at the state, and as well as late or missing referrals into maternal and infant health home visiting programs for eligible women, like maternal infant health programs or nurse family partnership programs, which are designed for first time moms. And then another uh, issue they identified was unreliable transportation causes missed appointments, and the transportation they're referring to is Medicaid paid. Um, transportation. 
So one of the things that our FEMA team was a part of was a subcommittee. There are, um, well, should I say the teams participated in a subcommittee to provide aggregate recommendations from all the local femurs to the state level infant mortality advisory council for review and policy considerations. And I don't know if you know it or not, but the local femurs include the counties of Berrien County, Calhoun, the city of Detroit, Genesee, Ingham County, Upper Peninsula, the Intertribal Council, Jackson County, Kalamazoo, Kent, Macomb, Muskegon, Oakland, and Saginaw County. So we have several femur teams in Michigan. And we got together as a subcommittee with all of our recommendations because we wanted to have them elevated to a state level for policy consideration and implementation. But we had too many to send at one time. So we had to do some coding and focus coding. And we came up with six overarching themes that we submitted. And the, one of the teams came up with the unplanned and unwanted pregnancies, inadequate birth spacing. What we, our intent was, was to align our recommendations with the ones that already exist at the state level in that report, the 2016-2019 Infant Mortality Reduction Plan. Uh, so the first recurring problem, again, is the unwanted pregnancies, and um, they recommended to expand family planning services to provide affordable, effective birth control options as a way to reduce unintended pregnancies. They also suggested, or should I say recommended, to provide guidance and consistent message messaging on appropriate birth spacings. The 18 months between pregnancies is the ideal time between pregnancies. They also suggested we train providers for counseling and discussions on reproductive health plans for patients. They suggested that we endorse pending Medicaid policy to expand access to LARCs, and those are long-acting reversible contraceptives, and they should be provided immediately postpartum, immediately after mom has a baby, before she goes home. And those methods for LARCs um, are methods of birth control that provide effective contraceptive for an extended period without requiring your user actions like birth control pills you take every day. However, LARCs include injections, intrauterine devices, and subdermal contraceptive uh, implants. The other, one of our other teams came up with this um, recommendation, and it had to do th with the problem of late inadequate prenatal care, especially for women of color. They recommend to reimburse dating ultrasound at first prenatal visits and include provider training on appropriate ultrasound billing, giving that Medicaid bundles all the prenatal care visits into one payment and they felt that it would be an incentive for physicians if they were paid separately for the first one and also to encourage moms to come in earlier in the pregnancy. Uh, they uh, recommended automating the screening for the social determinants of health barriers and referral and provide contact information for resources such as housing, transportation, child care, employment, that sort of thing. Uh, they wanted to suggest automate linking to community health workers and home visitation programs to facilitate convenient access to community-based resources. They also suggested to automate referrals from early identification sites such as your WIC and emergency departments and pharmacies to the OB clinics um, to community health workers and home visiting programs via an on-site access through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Service website, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, the third recurring problem that the subcommittee uh, identified, um, again, that aligns with the state's overarching um, goals, are lack of referrals for access to prenatal care and MIHP services. And MIHP, again, those are maternal infant health programs, and those are in-home, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just so excited. <laughs> uh, In-home visiting programs we have where they, the maternal infant health programs have a dyad of services. They have um, nurses, social workers, and dietitians that service moms throughout their pregnancy and up until the time the baby is one year old. 
Um, so this particular program, uh, or should I say subcommittee, they wanted to recommend that when, when women apply for Medicaid through the online um, website to offer an automatic enrollment into an MIHP referring clinic. Uh, they also wanted to bring MIHPs more to the front forefront of the New Bridges referral system. That's the system that they use to sign up for uh, state assistance. And it allows clients to apply for assistance, check their eligibility status, and manage their online accounts. So this particular uh, subcommittee team came up with those recommendations. And the My Bridges referral process, they actually sent me a screenshot, but I just wanted to let you know that the current topics, when a woman goes online to sign up for government assistance, they have these topics that um, are available for them to choose from, uh, food assistance, housing and shelter, utilities, health care, income and employment, transportation, child care, education, but not a home visiting program. So they thought that it was very important that this also be included and that a follow-up text message reminder be sent to them to encourage them to make sure that they enroll in a maternal infant health program. This was a uh, particularly uh, enthusiastic team, so their recommendation was more than one page. Uh, and they also recommended that once women apply on my bridges, that there should be a mechanism to initiate an automatic enrollment process into a home visiting program, and women will get information on how to call and make an appointment. Uh, they'll receive text messages from uh, an MIHP or Nurse Family Partnership, again, uh, that's for moms who um, are first-time moms for Nurse Family Partnership. And the program will likely get a referral about the client. So they're trying to close up the loop. If you sign up, somebody's going to contact you. And the insurance companies will also refer moms to MIHP programs and having worked for an MIHP program, the way that works is if they sign up, the insurance companies will send the maternal infant health programs these list of women who have signed up. And it is up to the program to reach out to the moms. And they also propose developing a quick referral system compatible with all electronic medical records so that uh, the primary care physicians and OBs can make a referral to the local navigators who can follow up on the MIHP referral. Um, and as Dr. Hankin had mentioned, when we talk about um, compatibility with electronic medical systems, electronic medical records across healthcare systems, it's what I call a, a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. So to try to interface, let's say, Detroit Medical Center's electronic medical records with St. John's, with Oakwoods, um, that's probably not going to happen. But I think it's a great BHAG. It's a big, hairy, audacious goal. So if they could interface, then there would be some continuity of care for these ladies. So they propose developing that quick system. And they also want the local navigators who work for the insurance companies uh, to make sure that they have adequate resources that are provided to the clients, which include that home visiting program involvement. Again, they propose coordinating community health workers and navigators among the different insurance companies. I gotta have it myself. Uh, local health care systems and um, 211. I don't know if you're familiar with that um, phone uh, referral system. It's a community based referral system and it provides um, referrals, community-based referrals, and they want to provide a uniform, uniform referral process for the ladies. They propose a comprehensive navigator program, which might also be a BHAG, but we were asked what did we recommend, and this is one of them. Uh, they want to ensure that there are care pathways that ultimately include a home visiting program for any lady that signs up for, um, for Medicaid. This team uh, addressed the problem, the recurring problem of late or missed referrals into these programs once they do occur and inadequate prenatal care. 
So they suggested as their recommendations to create funding infrastructure to support the community health workers, um, their utilization for outreach and navigation. Community health workers are a growing discipline of workers um, who actually serve as boots on the ground to actually go out into the homes and to visit with the mothers. So they're very um, important uh, discipline and they want to include those community health workers in that automated referral pathway for clinicians as well as the home visitation program and they want to include outreach for loss to contact referrals and home visitation enrollees in the community health worker navigator scope of work. So they want to actually put people on the ground in the community to reach out to these ladies so um, that they're not lost. Um, because most often times the, um, the clients that we review at FEMA, at Fetal Infant Mortality Review, are receiving Medicaid. So if we can use Medicaid as a conduit to make sure we can close up the gap for the care for these women, that's one of the recommendations they came up with. And recommendation number five had to do with transportation. The problem was is that Medicaid, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with this or not, but Medicaid paid transportation is substandard. They have substandard service providers and contractors who may or may not arrive to pick up the clients or to return them uh, to home in a timely manner, or they may not come back and get them at all. So in addition, many clients report experiencing late arrivals for their rides, causing them to be late or they just don't get a chance to go. So the subcommittee recommendation from that is that the Medicaid provider provided vendors receive additional training and be required to abide by new levels of accountability so that the clients will begin to receive the quality service that they deserve. Uh, they should be made aware of how important it is for the clients to arrive at their appointments in a timely manner as well as being returned to their homes. Sorry. Thank you. And one more. Thank you. So this is the last one that the subcommittee, came, the last recommendation that the subcommittee came up with. And the problem is that there is limited to um, sporadic ongoing media exposure and long-term state-sponsored media campaigns such as radio advertisements, billboards, television commercials, and social media outlets with regard to infant safe sleep practices, the ABCs of safe sleep, um, essential prenatal care, and its benefits, as well as essential pediatric care for all infants. You hear, you hear a lot of commercials, but I don't know if you hear a lot of them about infant safe sleep practices, the importance of prenatal care, and the importance of well baby visits. So the committee, subcommittee um, recommendation includes institute an ongoing statewide media campaign that is a state budgeted line item so that it doesn't go away to raise awareness and promote infant safe sleep practices, essential prenatal care, as well as essential pediatric care to ensure consistent messages across the state of Mich Michigan and that those messages be rotated from the west of, uh, side of the state to the east side to the upper peninsula and the lower peninsula but it needs to be done on an ongoing basis and I'm not sure if you remember the media campaign of this is your brain this is your brain on drugs um, it worked and when the funding for it stopped there was a slow spike and drug abuse. So this media campaign for infant safe sleep, prenatal care, and pediatric care needs to be an ongoing campaign because as you know as sociologists you need to hear a message more than once, maybe four or five times, before it starts to resonate with you and then you'll share that information with someone else. Mm -hmm. Running out of time, the bottom line, uh, the bottom line, um, the infant mortality rate in Detroit is more than twice that of the state of Michigan and the United States. Number two, the fetal infant mortality review case review team reviews abstracted case summaries of infant deaths for the purpose of identifying gaps in care and services that may prevent future infant deaths. And the community action team, our action arm, 
receives recommendations from the FEMA team to inform them of areas for implementation improvement from a policy, policy perspective with a lens toward reducing infant mortality. Number four, the Detroit Health Department provides infant safe sleep classes citywide and provides free pack and play portable cribs to ensure that babies have a safe sleeping environment. And I want to make sure you tur take your, turn your attention to the article, Welcome to Detroit, where back black babies are at higher risk of death. And be assured we are trying everything we can to turn this around. Thank you. We'll be glad to answer your questions. Yes. Um, actually, you recently wrote a paper on this topic, and one of the things that I found is that there are actually disparities in the treatment of African American women when they do consult a medical professional, either like before or during the course of labor. And is that a problem that you guys find or look into? So, like, disparity in treatment of them in actual hospitals? We do see that, yes. We do, unfortunately. It's implicit racism. Yes, I have a question. What, um, for the, so you recommended the home visiting program. What is that, what does that entail? Like, what is the purpose of going to the home? I don't know if that was thoroughly explained. I just didn't see it. Well, the mater let me just kind of give you a little overview. The Maternal Infant Health Program will dispatch, if you will, a nurse or social worker to the mom and they do an initial assessment. Can you speak a little louder? Yes. They do an initial assessment of the mom on various domains, on her, her home, um, the children in the home, food that they receive, just different things to find out what risk factors does she have in terms of her health, um, chronic diseases, that sort of thing. So they rank those areas. And then the nurses and the social workers will they have what they call plan of care. So if she has a plan, if she had, if she's ranked very high for intimate partner violence, there's a plan of care for intimate partner violence. So when they go out and they visit the mom at least once a month throughout her entire pregnancy, they're bringing her education and information. And they're also uh, recommending um, childbirth classes. And they're just actually becoming a support arm for this mother. So she's getting a nurse that comes to the home every month, a social worker, and if she has dietary concerns, a dietitian. Then when the baby is born, they also do assessment for the baby to make sure he's hitting those milestones. And if not, they refer them to an early on program. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering um, how the efficacy of this program is being assessed, if it's statewide, if it's monthly or annually. Um. For the MIHP? Yeah. It's uh, evaluated on an ongoing basis. As a matter of fact, I know that they've uh, issued a two that I know of, uh, two articles, and they, they changed their structure so that it was more uniform across the state so that they can't, could evaluate it fairly across the state for all programs. And is it working? Yes. Great. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> One question. Um, has, as at a hospital, midwives are being licensed, going through licensure, how about implementing um, home birth midwives to the program? Because they already go to people's homes mm -hmm. and do all prenatal care. They have a better outcome for um, trust. And then if you're building a good relationship of trust, usually your outcomes for, for baby and mom are better. And they also follow up at home after baby's born. It all happens there. Has that ever been on the radar to, to reach out to the, the community of midwives that have been here for decades to, um, as, as they're going to be licensed soon and come under the radar for um, maybe the Medicaid reimbursement and those sorts of things? No, we could do a whole another brown bag on midwives. Um, sure. But I'm thinking that in terms of incorporating midwives into the maternal infant health program mm -hmm. would have to be a state-generated conversation. Sure. That and they have to be, a, we have to be able to reimburse them through insurance. Right, right. And the women who are on Medicaid would not be eligible to use midwives who are not part well, of a well, hospital that's base. Hopefully that's to be changing, right. though, because the lots of other states, I come from the state who, right. um, as, a, as a midwife, I got reimbursed by Medicaid. Right. Um, so that's not the case in, in Michigan, so that's a that real that's barrier. That's why hopefully it will change. But I just curious, like, I know that there's been a lot of research on the Outcomes, as, especially with the 
any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Just a quick question. Hello, Dr. Hank. Hi. <laughs> um, the, the water issue, you know, that's a very serious problem for women that are pregnant and otherwise. So, I, and I apologize, I came in late and mentioned something about this. But, um, we didn't say that's okay, Deborah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, how, how are we addressing that issue for pregnant women? having the water turned off by the city of Detroit and, you know, obviously can cause some dire consequences for their health. Well, from the FEMA's perspective, our recommendations are funneled to a community action team and then to the state. So the social issues that are actually going on, like we were saying, water shutoffs, mm -hmm. we don't address that from our perspective. But um, we are aware of the challenges that moms face. Often we've even done uh, case reviews where we saw pictures of um, homes that did not have electricity, but an extension cord was running through a puddle of water out the back door to the line in the alley. So we do know that these women are faced with many, many issues. Um, See, one of the other issues that was if they don't present for care until they're in labor and delivery, there's not much we can do. And so we really need to get a system so women feel comfortable getting to prenatal care very early in the pregnancy and having physicians, this is one of the recommendations of the state, go through an automated checklist, like tell us where you're living. Do you have water leaks? Do you have mold? Do you have hot water, cold water that's safe? Do you, do you have heat? But, you know, unless we can get them into care, it's just so hard for femur to try and address those kinds of things. It's very frustrating, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Delighted to come today, and thank you so much. Thank you.